Hello and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. Today's video is going to be hopefully quite a, a short one, just taking an initial look at the BirdClef 2021 Bird Call Identification Challenge. Now there will be a blog post to go along with this video, which I'll link in the description, and all three of the notebooks that I reference are public, so you can take a look at the code as well. So this competition is all around audio classification, and it's exciting to me because I actually ran a very similar competition for Zindi last year, um, but as the host, I didn't really participate. So this one is a great chance to actually take some of the lessons learned from there and some of the thoughts I've had on audio classification and apply them. So I'm excited to see how far we can take that. So first step with a competition like this is uh, kind of exploring the, the data um, and choosing what representation we're going to use. So audio, obviously, we have raw samples many, many thousands of times every second. Um, that's not ideal, although some models can use that. Um, but I knew from the start that I wanted to work with something called a spectrogram, which is a, a sort of more compressed representation of audio. And how it works is you have frequency on the kind of y-axis and time on the x-axis. And so you can see the intensity at different frequencies over time. And this um, is very useful for interpreting all kinds of sounds. It's what's used a lot in voice recognition and so on. Um, and so I've got a couple of handy functions for taking in a chunk of audio um, at a given sample rate and turning it into some sort of spectrogram representation. So that's that's uh, representing the data, but we still need to get the training data ready for the model. And one of the nuances with this competition is that it has these fairly long recordings and you can't guarantee that a bird is calling for that whole duration. Um, so we need to be able to pick out parts of that longer recording where there's actually the bird calls that we're wanting to learn. Otherwise, we're just learning on noise. Um, so there's a whole bunch of code for display here. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're taking an audio file and we're looking for areas where there's a high signal to noise ratio. Um, so just to illustrate, here's the sort of first training file. So you can hear the bird calling in this first little section. There's actually a couple of other bird calls in the background. And then it's a while before that call repeats. So if we were to just sample a random five second chunk from this audio, we might not even have the bird that we're interested in. Um, so what these plots here are is this PCEN based signal to noise ratio with different window sizes and just picking some sort of peaks where this is nice and high making sure they're not all con um, congregated together and this is what we're going to use to sample this larger piece of audio into five second chunks and the reason I chose five seconds that's how the competition is scored you make predictions for every five second window um, and it also seems like a nice trade-off between representing enough of the call to get some of the patterns but not having too long of a window where you might have silence for 9 out of 10 seconds and then only a small segment of call. Um, so that's this first notebook is just figuring out how to do that, um, borrowing some code for this PCN from this um, wonderful BirdVox project. Um, but yeah, and then at the end of the notebook running through all of the training files and for each one um, storing the location of a whole bunch of different um, peaks. So. For each one, we're going to compute the spectrogram, going to compute this PCN based signal to noise ratio, smooth it out, and then we're going to just take um, a sort of list of these peaks and we're going to store it in a data frame. So this is data we can use going forward. Um, so this was exploring the data. The nice thing with this whole process, it also gave me an excuse to listen to a bunch of calls, to look at the spectrograms, to really try and understand what's going on here. Um, and then it's ready to be, to be modeled. Um, so for the model, took a fairly simple approach. We're loading in this data that has our label, the file name, and then of course the peak location. So this is going to be the time where the call is happening. Um, and again, we have our functions for turning a given section of audio into a spectrogram. Um, so to get this into a data loader so that we can use fast AI's models and training and all of that goodness, um, took a little bit of experimenting to get this right. But we're building a custom, basically a custom item transform using that to build our data loaders. And this is going to tell FastAI, given um, some sort of index for the, for the file or whatever the file name, how to get the label um, and how to get the inputs. So this encodes function here is going to return the spectrogram and the label. Um, and by implementing decodes, we are also going to be able to show the results. So um, don't worry too much trying to understand that if you want to figure out how that code works, this is the sort of tutorial I followed. Um, excellent documentation from FastAI on how to put together these kinds of data loaders in a few different ways. Um, but anyway, once I got it working, I didn't fiddle with it too much more um, because it's now able to pass in our spectrogram 
into the model. And once we've got that, we can just use off-the-shelf standard model, in this case, the smallest one I could, ResNet 18, um, did a, a little bit of learning rate finding, but mainly just picked a fairly arbitrary learning rate and number of cycles. Now, these pre-trained models, we usually train the head first, but in this case, it's trained on ImageNet images, and we're doing audio, they're quite different, so I didn't really see much value in training the head separately and then training the whole model. Just unfreeze it and train it straight away. Um, and you can see over time the loss decreases nicely, the validation loss also decreases, and we get ever-increasing accuracy. Um, now you could train this for much longer, um, but I actually ran it on the CPU so as not to use up my GPU time, and I wasn't too worried about getting an amazing model at this stage, we just want something that works. Um, so at the end, 53% accuracy, now that might not sound like much, except that there's nearly 400 bird species represented, so getting it right 53% of the time is excellent, and I know from my own benchmarking of um, birders and bird guides, um, human accuracy, you know, with even a small subset of birds that they know, is something like 40 to 50, 60 percent. Um, so this model's already doing not too bad. Um, and we export this model for later use, and that's our baseline model training done. Um, now the final step in this here, which is a little bit interesting and again is, is a nuance of this competition, is that the test data doesn't look like the training data, right? It's not recordings with a single bird, Instead, it's much longer recordings with multiple birds calling. Um, and so I didn't do my own evaluation notebook or, or anything fancy for the submission. I kind of piggybacked off someone else's implementation in terms of loading the data and, and getting up the test set. But basically for every five second interval in, our, um, in each recording of our test set, we want to produce a list of birds that we think are calling. Um, so I create a sort of sample submission um, we run through each of those five second chunks, we turn it into a spectrogram, we use our same kind of data loaders as before, um, but this time we create a test data set, get the predictions, and then use those in combination with a threshold to make our predictions. Um, and so most of them there's no bird calling, but every now and again there's a bird making a sound, and then you can see, um, let's, uh, oh, this is not running, um, you'll have to take my word for it, the model does sometimes predict that there are birds calling, um, again from that guy's very helpful notebook got some metrics that we can calculate, F1 score is the one we're interested in, uh, it's what the competition uses. Um, and so I kind of actually ran through a bunch of different thresholds trying to see what was what was optimum, um, but it turns out it didn't make too much of a difference. We save our submission and we can submit this to the competition and get up there on the leaderboard. Um, so just to reiterate, this is a, a very baseline model and all I'm doing here is getting familiar with the data, sort of figuring out some approaches that I want to take, like getting my data loaders looking nice and getting at least a space to put data augmentation at a later date. Um, so it's the simplest model, it's only trained for a short while and it's only trained on the CPU, um, but it still gets up there, you know, we, we have to scroll down quite a ways before we get to our entry. Um, but at least it's a starting point and we know that if we use a bigger model, we train for longer, those are going to be like free improvements. Um, but then we also, before we do that, we can really nail down, are we going to do any augmentation on the data? Are there better strategies for making our predictions? For example, I know there's um, different localities for the different recordings, and the birds have sort of distributions that they follow, so we could rule out European birds maybe from a recording that's in North America, for example, and I think that would actually take our accuracy up a lot. So that's the reason I sort of start with this very simple model, is it gives us a quick starting point, and we can begin tweaking all these different aspects. How do I make predictions? Um, how do I do data augmentation and so on? And then later we can go for the easy wins like training a larger model or training a bunch of models and ensembling them together. So that's our quick overview of my entry for this bird cleft challenge. I've only just started, so I will hopefully be doing a couple more videos just like with the movement classification one. We'll um, check in partway through to see how it's going, see what of those improvements I mentioned are actually um, having a meaningful effect on our score. And then at the end I'll do kind of a post-mortem um, see how well I did it in the final leaderboard, uh, look at maybe some things that I might have done better after seeing other people's submissions, and kind of just taking it apart from there. But uh, that said, I hope you enjoyed this first installment. Uh, do let me know if there's any suggestions you have for what I should try, or if you've got other types of videos you'd prefer. Um, this channel is very much an experiment and it's early days, so very happy to take feedback and suggestions. Cheers for now.